Ladies and gentlemen, I congratulate you for staying. Um, we'll try to make it worth your while. Um, I'm Steve Verlanger from the New York Times, and I'm going to moderate, I think, what could be one of the most interesting panels we've had, because this is a panel about Afghanistan, but it's a kind of a metaphor for the whole experience in Afghanistan, because we have no American on the panel. The Americans have already left. <laughs> the NATO presence is thin. Um, here we are dealing with what I think will matter, which is the region and what the region wants, what the Afghans want. Um, and we've also, I, did, I told people to sit wherever they wanted, but we also have Pakistan at one end and India at the other, <laughs> with Afghanistan in the middle. So that also seems somehow appropriate. Um, Afghanistan is the war that Barack Obama thought was the good war. Um, he now can't wait to get out. He set a date, NATO agreed, end of 2014. The problem is as soon as you set a date, everyone sets their watches. Um, and we saw this with the Australians, we have seen it with the Canadians, we've now seen it with the French. Um, Francois Hollande, I think the Americans will fail to get him to change his stated um, deadline of end of combat troops by the end of this year, though I'm sure there'll be some fudging about um, coordination, and certainly the French will stay to do training and so on. There's a big argument about how much money would be required to keep the Afghan forces properly trained and paid. Um, even Nicolas Sarkozy was going to leave a year early. So, you know, we're into an end game, but frankly, having talked to Mark Grossman, the man who's been charged by the Americans to try to make a deal, to make it work well, <coughs> with the Taliban, um, it's a very difficult job um, because the Taliban set their watches too. And they are watching, they're waiting, um, and they're doing their best to undermine um, the confidence of the Afghan forces in themselves and in our confidence in, in them. So to me, we have a chance here to hear what the region wants and to hear what the Afghans themselves want. So I thought we would begin um, with Pakistan. Najam Sethi is the editor-in-chief of the Daily Times in, in Lahore. Complicated relationship with the United States, complicated relationship with India, Pakistan. Mr. Sethi, set the stage for us, please. Thank you, Stephen. <clears throat> Well, I know this is the last session and people are tired and they want us to get on with it. <clears throat> so the obvious question, uh, what have we got uh, right now that we're going to leave behind? And then uh, what's going to happen to what we've got after, after we've gone? So what have we got that we're going to leave behind? Well, we have a strategic relationship between Kabul and um, America. We have a strategic relationship between Kabul and India, but we don't yet have a strategic relationship between Kabul and Pakistan. Uh, that has to be worked out. <clears throat> we also have a strategic relationship with America that uh, outlines two main issues. First, the sort of troops, the number of troops that will be left behind, approximately. But we don't know what these troops will do how many bases they will be, what sort of weapons they'll have, what will be the scope of their duties, and so on and so forth. And then there's a second dimension, which is the amount of money that America and the international community will give this government uh, after we've gone. Uh, various figures are being touted, four billion. <coughs> um, uh, but this is interesting, considering that currently, um, over $150 billion a year are being spent on Afghanistan, $100 billion on U.S. forces and $50 billion on the Afghans. And then after U.S. forces have gone and you've only got 30,000 or 
thereabouts of troops, your total funding will come down to uh, four billion. Um, it's difficult to imagine how this will see the uh, new Afghan government through. Um, equally, <clears throat> there are lots of questions about uh, the Afghan National Army, whether or not it will be able to take the pressure after uh, most U ISAF and US troops have withdrawn. Uh, you will recall that in 1992, when the communists were overthrown by the Mujahideen, uh, there was a much more forceful state, Afghan state, at their disposal, including an Afghan army, um, which was multi-ethnic. Uh, now the situation is very different. Um, and um, uh, you'll also recall that when the Americans left Vietnam, uh, they left an army in South, South Vietnam that was much better uh, equipped to deal with the situation there uh, than the current Afghan army is here. And you saw what happened in, in, in Vietnam after the Americans left. Um, so there are lots of questions about what will happen uh, to the Afghan National Army and what will happen, um, uh, what the scope of the American troops will be and how they will manage to hold on. The second is Mr. Karzai. <clears throat> what will happen to him after we've gone? Well, uh, Mr. Karzai, as you know, has already been president for two terms, and he cannot stand for a third term. So there's a whole question mark over uh, the nature of democracy, constitutionalism, the political system, uh, and so on. And there are no answers yet about what will happen. Uh, this is all up in the air. And then there is the question of the aid that is going to be forthcoming from the Americans. That's linked to the whole notion of governance by the Karzai regime. And as we know, uh, despite all the money and all the weapons and all the pressure from the Americans in the last few years uh, for the Karzai government to get its act together, uh, and put up a degree of governance, uh, that has not happened. Indeed, corruption is, remains at an all-time high. And it's anybody's guess um, what will happen uh, to the whole system of governance and corruption and so on and so forth, which is linked uh, to the security in, uh, uh, of this regime and the U.S. relationship with it. Then the third is the regional countries. So what will happen to their role? Well, it's interesting that... Um, <clears throat> Of all the regional countries, obviously Pakistan is the most important, and I'll come to that separately right at the end. <clears throat> but it's interesting that at Chicago, neither Iran has been invited nor China has been invited. Pakistan's invitation currently is in the doldrums. We are not entirely sure whether Pakistan will go to Chicago or not, depending on whether uh, the NATO pipeline is restored in the next uh, three or four days or not, um, uh, and so on. So the role of the regional countries remains completely undefined. And they are the ones who will have to live in that neighborhood with whatever we leave behind. Um, then there is this uh, question of the Taliban. In the old days, uh, the only good Taliban was a dead Taliban. Then we found out that there were good Taliban and bad Taliban. Um, so then it was talk, talk, and fight, fight. Now it is talk and fight. Um, eventually, we have to get to talk, talk. Uh, but how do we get to talk, talk? The Qatar process. Um, hasn't taken off for a host of reasons which we can discuss. Um, and this morning, um, one of the core negotiators in President Karzai's team, um, Arsala Rahmani, was assassinated in Kabul. He was president, former President Buranidin Rabani's right-hand man, and he was assassinated earlier. So President Karzai's attempts to open the talks with the, with the Taliban are facing difficulties as well. There is a tripartite mechanism which is Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the United States, uh, which is supposed to be holding its seventh meeting uh, today and tomorrow in Islamabad. And that's the three countries who are supposed to uh, find ways of getting the Taliban to make an entry into, into, the, into the negotiations. And six meetings have yielded nothing, and I doubt very much whether the seventh meeting is also going to yield anything. Uh, so we have uh, this, this lot of problems about how do you bring the Taliban in <clears throat> because uh, uh, their attitude sim seems to be that we'll just hang in there and wait for the Americans to go, and then we'll see what we need to do. Um, and then finally, uh, there is Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan, um, uh, the backlash of uh, um, the Afghan uh, situation means that Pakistan has lost nearly 5,000 troops and officers uh, in battling the Pakistani Taliban, who are an offshoot of the Afghan Taliban, but are different. 
the Pakistanis have had to endure nearly 6,000 bomb explosions in the country in the last five years. Uh, over 35,000 civilians have been killed. And yet, at the end of the day, there is no <clears throat> discernible role for Pakistan in the end game. It's almost as though Mr. Karzai wants to do a, a, an end game by himself and the Americans want to do one on their own and Pakistan is being left out of the loop. Which is why Pakistan is becoming an increasingly uh, disgruntled, frustrated, alienated and angry former ally. You'll recall that President Bush used to talk of a strategic relationship between the United States and Pakistan. Uh, two years ago, there was a last bit, last nth minute emphasis on the strategic part of it. By last year, it had been downgraded to a transactional relationship. And now we are on the edge of a precipice. Uh, the NATO supplies have been uh, uh, halted for six months. Uh, there is anti-Americanism in the country. <clears throat> Neither the politicians nor the army is prepared to own this war as their war. Uh, or to help uh, the Americans get back on track vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. And, um, um, and now there's talk in, American, in the American Congress about sanctions on Pakistan, fines on Pakistan, uh, stopping the aid uh, uh, to Pakistan, and so on and so forth. Now, Pakistan is a country that is critical to what happens in Afghanistan, the end game, to what, uh, when, what happens when you leave Afghanistan. Pakistan hasn't chosen Afghanistan. Pakistan is part of that region. Pakistan has 30 million Pashtuns. Afghanistan is 12 and a half, 13 million. We have 30 million Pashtuns. We have a border with Afghanistan, which is known as the Durand Line, which Afghanistan has not recognized as an international border. We would like that recognition to set the ball rolling because we fear that Afghans, uh, Afghans have uh, claims on Pakistani territory, especially on uh, that territory, which is the tribal areas, uh, which is across the Durand line, which is where most Pashtuns on Pakistan's side live. Even when the Taliban were in power, uh, uh, they, they, they were not prepared to <coughs> accept the Durand line. Forget about earlier regimes. So Pakistan has a very real problem. During the Afghan Jihad in the 1980s, we had three and a half million refugees, all of whom subsequently acquired Pakistani identities and ID cards and so on. And we ended up having to look after them. Uh, now, uh, the situation is far more dangerous because the backlash of this war has been the arrival of the Pakistani Taliban. These are people that we had originally, uh, uh, many of them are part of the original jihad that was retooled after Afghanistan in the 1980s and turned towards India. But now that we are about to build, start building the blocks of peace with India, these have been decommissioned and they've all gone to the fr fr Fata area and set up their own Taliban organizations. And they are the ones that we are fighting. So we have the Afghan Taliban sitting in our country. We have the Pakistani Taliban who are fighting us. And if the end game in Afghanistan is one that is inimical in any way uh, uh, to our core interests, <clears throat> which have nothing to do with India now, which have to do purely with protecting our border and protecting our security, and uh, in making sure that the Taliban look towards Kabul uh, for sustenance and for their future as their homeland, but they don't look towards Islamabad, and they don't look across the Durand line into those areas that are Pashtun areas. And they don't tie up with our Pashtuns, because our Pashtuns have been radicalized in the last 10 years. They have become more Talibanized than ever before. So we have a very serious problem on our hands. And yet, the incredible thing is, Pakistan is completely out of the loop so far, it seems, as far as the American and international and NATO endgame for Afghanistan is concerned which simply tells me that whatever game it is, if Pakistan is not sitting at the ringside, if Pakistan is not able to have the Taliban accommodated properly uh, in Kabul, then Pakistan will have a very serious problem and whatever we leave behind, whatever NATO leaves behind will not be sustainable. Thank you. Um, just before we move on, I just want to press you on something, if I may. I mean, sometimes I think, um, Pakistan has suffered quite a lot in the sense that before all of this, there was no Taliban in Pakistan, there was no Al-Qaeda in Pakistan, there was very little radical Islam in Pakistan. Um, and in, in, in a way, you're now having to um, deal with all of these things. But when you describe having a seat at the table for the end game, 
Can you be a little more specific about what that means? What, you know, what in Pakistani eyes that means? Well, you know, <clears throat> in the 1990s, a similar problem was faced because you had the Tajiks and Uzbeks and, and the Pashtuns. And there were several peace accords which were brokered by Pakistan and Saudi Arabia to ensure a degree of stability in uh, uh, Kabul. And eventually they broke down because of the ethnic problem. Um, and then everything was swept aside when the Mujahideen were also swept aside and the Taliban arose as a, an important force. And then the Tajik and Uzbek forces were pushed back uh, and they seized Kabul all on their own. So now the situation is that um, unless we wish to leave Afghanistan as a partitioned Afghanistan, with the Americans and Tajiks and Uzbeks up in Kabul and north, and the southern Afghanistan in the hands of the Taliban, uh, uh, which is going to be a disastrous thing because it will be disastrous for Pakistan and for Afghanistan because the civil war will continue. Um, uh, we have to be able to find a mechanism to bring the Taliban into, of, into Kabul. And that is the challenge. I mean, there are not going to be any easy solutions there. But the point I'm making is this, that Pakistan can either be a deal breaker or a facilitator. Um, until now, nobody has made the attempt to make Pakistan a facilitator, which means that de facto it is ending up as a deal breaker because of the acute frustration and, uh, uh, it's, it, and the fact that its interests are not being taken care of. So that's the sort of bridge that has to be uh, made in the next year or so. Thank you. Um, now I thought we would hear the Indian perspective because India has stakes in this too that are quite severe and I don't think we talk about them often enough. So Har, um, Har, um, Harinder Sekon um, is a senior fellow at the, at the Observer Research Foundation in India has written on this topic and please, Harinder, please tell us what India wants, what, what is it afraid of, um, how does it see a stable Afghanistan and how can it help? <coughs> Thank you so much, and I must thank Kadri for, and her team for having invited me to speak over here a second time, and for putting up this wonderful conference and including her team of volunteers who've done an ex excellent job. And it's ironical, I was here in 2009 and spoke on one of the early morning breakfast sessions on Afghanistan, and at that time, President Obama had just announced his AFPAC strategy in March. And at that time, he had talked of a regional solution. You know, he had talked about dismantling terror, uh, dismantling and disrupting terror infrastructure in Afghanistan, uh, in looking for a regional solution to solving the Afghan crisis. Many flip-flops later, that's how we look at it. Uh, there have been any number of... Um, uh, amendments made to the original AFPAC strategy. McChrystal came out with his uh, surge strategy, and after that, um, you know, you've had um, a whole number of advisors, uh, commissions set up, the Bruce Rydell Committee, and things on advising. But I feel this new uh, announcement, which the Americans uh, made, you know, the strategic partnership with Afghanistan, does it break any new ground? Is it going to be the long-term settlement solution uh, we are looking forward to? Because in between, between 2009 and 2012, we've heard 2012 as the withdrawal date, which made the Taliban feel very happy that they had the time on their sides that the Americans would cut and run. 2014 again, you know, there was so much of media attention been given to 2014. And I think this is what has actually strengthened the Taliban. And, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Najim Sethi has outlined everything so beautifully and logically. But I think you cannot really distinguish between a moderate and a hardcore Taliban. U.S. negotiations with the Taliban have run into trouble. Uh, President Karzai has not made any headway with, uh, in his talks with the Taliban. And uh, so can we really bring them into a negotiated settlement mainstream kind of a thing remains iffy. It remains to be seen if they can be brought into it and a successful governance, governance model for Afghanistan be found. But since I've been asked to focus more on India's uh, interests and India's, uh, uh, you know, India has uh, invested 
almost $2 billion as aid. It is the fifth largest donor in aid to in Afghanistan. India is viewed very positively in Afghanistan. There is this tremendous comfort level between the Afghan government and the Indian government. And uh, the kind of work which India has done, you know, building of roads, building of hospitals, uh, educational, uh, setting up uh, educational institutions, and building up the, uh, uh, and uh, constructing the Afghan parliament building. All these are very visible symbols of India's aid to Afghanistan. And India would definitely like Afghanistan to be, uh, you know, like, uh, we are committed and we actually believe because there have been a lot of uh, talks after the India-Afghan strategic partnership of 20, uh, 2011 October when President Karzai uh, delivered uh, the memorial lecture in the foundation I work for. And uh, he also talked of a regional solution and that the India-Afghan uh, settlement partnership was not directed against any regional country, especially Pakistan. So that is the spirit, and India and Pakistan have opened up you know, free trade, uh, the, the border trade, and we're looking for ways and means in which to open up our agreements uh, and to open up the trade between India and Pakistan in the borders. So that is the way we look at it, and we would not like to exclude Pakistan from any or any of the other regional players. But what becomes tricky is what kind of a role do you envisage for Iran? And this is one of the tricky situations which we feel, uh, which we find ourselves in while speaking with the United States. Um, you know, uh, at one time I remember in 2003, 2004, when U.S. State Department officials would visit Delhi, they would uh, want to know if India could play a role in facilitating, you know, which was in a different context, not the Afghan context, but if they could facilitate a dialogue between the U.S. and Iran. It is happening now, I believe, at a track to level facilitated perhaps by Turkey. But this went off the radar. And when we look at U.S. policies vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan, you cannot have a Western-dictated settlement for Afghanistan. You have to involve the regional uh, players. And by the regional uh, countries, I would include Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran, and India. Because till you do not involve the neighborhood, uh, and uh, evolve some kind of uh, mechanisms and strategies, um, nothing would come. Unfortunately, where India was uh, bogged down was the US deciding on what kind of a role, what level of involvement India would have in Afghanistan, uh, basically because of its commitment to the US-Pakistan uh, arrangement. You know, because Pakistan, Kayani also talked of uh, Pakistan's strategic depth being disturbed if India got a greater role in Afghanistan. But fortunately for us, uh, post Osama killing May of last year, things have changed. The United States has realized that um, whatever we had been talking about, uh, you know, Pakistan a certain, uh, being a safe haven for terrorists and the ISI, uh, you know, facilitating uh, certain uh, fundamentalist activities has come out in the open. And this current stress and strains of US-Pakistan relations and India's own uh, strategic partnership with Afghanistan have, uh, have come as a game changer. Because in London, January 2010, India was not even invited for the London conference. We were kept out and we were quite uh, upset about it. Whereas now, um, the U U.S. is actually speaking to India. We uh, have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, we've been encouraged to step up our engagement, uh, uh, our financial aid in Afghanistan. So, um, uh, which has worked to our, uh, 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 which has worked well and to our advantage. But for India, you know, like um, there has been criticism to Indian policy from within the country itself that firstly we need to avoid a scenario where we end up committing more than what we can deliver financially. And would this in the long term serve India's security interests? We are not for a Talibanized uh, Afghanistan. And uh, we would like a democratically elected uh, democracy having firm roots in Afghanistan. 
And so far, our policy has been going piggyback on the U.S. policy. You know, it, it's the U.S. which has dictated our, the level of our involvement and engagement. But I think things are beginning to change. But India can only be a game changer or uh, play a slightly bigger role, which would uh, facilitate its own uh, interests, if we can build up a regional consensus by uh, calibrating and uh, getting over the differences and competing interests of the regional players. This is very important because, uh, and here we have to do a lot of confidence building exercise. <coughs> we have started with Pakistan, we're speaking with Iran, but Iran is a red herring as far as the United States is concerned. So I think it's in the open and I'll get back uh, later on uh, during the course of the Thank you very much and thank you for bringing up Iran as well because that's one of the players not actually represented here. Um, let's go to Kabul itself. Um, <coughs> Amrullah Saleh is a former national security director of <coughs> Afghanistan. Um, you've lived through a very difficult 10 years. You've been trying to build something. The West is not ever sure the foundations are there. Um, you, as the West begins to pull out, you're more and more subject to regional forces and interests. And and um, competitions, and clearly there are all kinds of centrifugal forces at work. Um, so how confident are you that 2014 is going to leave behind it a representative, united, stable, sustainable um, Afghan government that's credible um, and that somehow can win the confidence of the Afghan people? And then what do you want from your neighbors? Okay. Thank you very much. I uh, thank the management of the conference, especially uh, Katri, for inviting me. I would like to give the Afghan uh, perspective and then briefly touch upon the centrality of Pakistani role especially. As we are approaching 2014, there are a series of assumptions and raw calculations, rough calculations. And these assumptions are that the current game gains by the NATO and I ANSF will be sustained. Uh, when NATO draws down nearly 90% of its troops, ANSF with some mentors uh, from NATO countries, particularly United States, will hold the Taliban at bay. Whereas with maximum NATO presence and with maximum ANSF, the Taliban have not been kept at bay. They managed to infiltrate our big cities. And the hold period, the hold stage of NATO strategy, clear uh, hold built, we are in the hold, but it's not a perfect hold and it's not near perfect hold. Assumption two is by signing SPA strategic partnership agreement, NATO members, particularly the United States, will keep the bad hand of some of our bad neighbors again away from Afghanistan. The question is, with massive incentives post 9-11, with massive international pressure, if not very public pressure, and with massive military intervention in Afghanistan, these bad hands were not kept away. What gives us the confidence that with less resources, less pressure, less incentive, these hands will be kept away? And uh, <clears throat> third assumption is President Karzai will withdraw in 2014, parallel with withdrawal of uh, U.S. troops, and he will pave the way for a smooth legal ter political transition, and until then he will bring a measure of reform which will uh, pave the way for a credible Afghan election. Again, if we did not have a highly credible Afghan election in 2009 with massive international attention, 
And if with two years left to 2014 and no visible pressure on President Karzai to bring reform, what gives the West confidence that the elections in 2014 will be better than 2009 and the security will be better than 2009? Assumption four is the sanctuaries of Taliban and Pakistan and maintenance of these sanctuaries, i.e. Quetta Shura and Miram Shah Shura and Gulbuddin Hekmatyar's headquarters and Peshawar, will become unsustainable for Pakistan and Pakistanis will eventually push these groups into negotiations with President Karzai. Again, the question is, if under this big pressure over the past 10 years, Pakistan did not push them to negotiate and play a, a scripted role in the Afghan politics, why would Pakistan then push them to negotiate with a weaker Afghan state? When you speak to generals and diplomats in Kabul and say, <clears throat> why Pakistan helped the Taliban, they say, it's an insurance policy for Pakistan because they kept these forces for rainy day. And for Pakistani establishment, the rainy day is 2014. And until then, they will not encourage the Taliban to enter into any meaningful negotiations. The question again is, <clears throat> if Taliban is a Pakistani proxy, what is the Pakistani Taliban? That I have a lot of evidence to suggest they are totally two different groups. Uh, I won't elaborate that now. Then the uh, fifth assumption is that under the military pressure of the last 10 years, the Taliban are no longer representing militant extremism. This is a fundamental mistake. Moderate Taliban is an invention of the current Western narrative in order to justify withdrawal of troops, reduction of the agenda, and reduction of the attention. <clears throat> By offering to negotiate with the Taliban, the so-called Qatar process, actually we have offered recognition, legitimacy, and a space for militant extremism. This is in total contrast and contradiction to the macro objectives of post 9 11 uh, intervention. Because the post 9 11 objective was deny militant extremism, a space, legitimacy, and ability to govern again. So when you negotiate with them, and they still continue to be more violent and more savvy than before, you provide them recognition. Unfortunately, that damage is done and it's a massive damage to the credibility of the mission. Now, with that said, I'm not arguing that let us keep the current level of the NATO forces, let us increase the current uh, number of NATO forces and find a military solution to the problem. That's not my argument. What I say is, yes, the current level of the forces is not sustainable, so what will keep us at uh, ease to have a functioning government and the ability to keep the insurgents at bay uh, is the following. A, we should not forget the, the big objectives. The big objective was do not allow militant extremism to come to power through the barrel of the gun. And we are not sure with the current narrative, with current soft outreach, there will be any incentive for the Taliban to lay down their arms. Two, the, uh, the situation uh, is such that Pakistan claims that they are not part of the game. I think they were central part of the game for 11 years. Uh, the Afghan army from 2002 to 2007 was kept very, very small in order to appease the Pakistanis. I remember specifically US military stopped constructing a air strip in Paktika province under the pressure of, of the Pakistanis. The Afghan army was defined 
as an army to intervene in emergency situations, rippling or stopping ethnic rebellion and uh, tribal dissent. There was no mention of protecting Afghan borders. It was specifically to keep Pakistan happy and to insist on centrality of Pakistan's role as a NATO ally in the region. I am very, very glad that the Pakistani government is now sensing and feeling part of the heat. If they felt this heat, about eight years ago, they would have changed their behavior a little bit by now. So, where are we heading? If, again, I am not saying that the current level of military support should be there, I say the application of the force and the application of the resources should be done in a much smarter way. Afghan force, ANSF is very big compared to the economy of Afghanistan and our situation, but it's not a smart force. They have bad weapons, they have bad equipment, they are totally, totally dependent on United States for ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and, 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 uh, and reconnaissance. Uh, and plus, they are not trained uh, good enough to be watchful of our eastern and southern, uh, and southern uh, uh, borders. What will be the ideal situation, what I call a dream scenario? The dream scenario will be bring a measure of reform before 2014 that the next elections will produce and bring into scene a partner for the, Af for the international friends of Afghanistan and gain the confidence of the Afghan people uh, back into the pro democratic process. Whether the Taliban speak to us or not, if we have that type of a situation, the Afghan government can live with a low intensity uh, insurgency. But if we continue the situation muddled through, where there is no reform, no breakthrough in talks with the Taliban, where there is no visible and tangible pressure on Pakistan to close down the sanctuaries, Everything we say about 2014 is largely, I am afraid to say, a self-deceptive and self-deceptive uh, 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 narrative. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for, oops, for a very clear and re slightly depressing tale. Um, let, let me just ask you bluntly, um, if things don't go well with the, with the negotiated endgame, can the Afghan forces, mm -hmm. as trained with money and help, I mean, because obviously NATO is not going away entirely, mm -hmm. can it hold back the Taliban mm -hmm. for the medium future? First of all, under so much pressure over the past 35 years, we have not fragmented as a nation. What has fragmented in Afghanistan is power structures and state structures. Uh, we are still very proud of being Afghan, despite the fact that it's a dirt poor country and it has been the scene of, of invasions by, by powers throughout, throughout the history. We are not seeing Afghanistan sort of a, a country which will fall apart along the ethnic lines. There is the example of Najibullah's government which fell down uh, in uh, 1992. We very much hope and we have the reason, despite hope being not a measurable commodity, we have hope that 2014 will not be uh, 89 and it will, be, it will not be 92. The situation is different. Now, the reason Najibullah's army uh, collapsed because Soviet Union stopped supporting it. And because Afghanistan sank into chaos because Pakistan had a, 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 a double-face strategy then and, and it has a double-face strategy uh, today. Now, what will keep the Afghan uh, army fighting is continued uh, financial and technical support. Now, 
We hope in Chicago the size and the amount of subsidy for the Afghan forces will be uh, specified and with that amount we will have a clear view of where we will go with these forces. Now, the Taliban military pressure <clears throat> will not fragment the Afghan national security forces. The Taliban threat and insurgency will obviously undermine the writ of the government in certain areas. It will stop development work. It will damage the environment enough that we will not be able to bring uh, foreign investment and start uh, major development projects, but they will not be able to overrun the state. However, as our distinguished uh, colleague from Pakistan said, for Pakistan, the game is an India-centric game. It's an India-centric strategy. They want Taliban to control East and Southern Afghanistan to create a buffer. In other words, Pakistan is trying to expand the borders of the Fatah tribally, federally tribal, uh, administered tribal areas so that India's access and the perceived influence is evicted from those parts of the country and the border is controlled by a proxy friendly to Pakistan. I totally agree with my friend that Islamabad is, is afraid of, of Talibanization, but they are not working with us to dismantle the Taliban. They are giving the Taliban resources and enough incentive to look towards Kabul. That's not the solution. If Islamabad starts to act like a state and deal with the state as India does and stop dealing with non-state actors in Afghanistan, the situation will change, will change dramatically. So, Thank what? You. Well, I mean, fin finish your thought. Okay. I, I apologize. But. What you leave behind if, again, I said those two things are not done, reform, and a very clear definition of who is the enemy, which is now blurred, we will have a muddle through a strategy, a status quo continuing, and there will not be breakthrough. However, we will not collapse and fragment as it is predicted by certain pessimist circles. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sati, we'll come back to you, but first, I think we should talk to the Western elements, right? Um, Mr. Pali Yarvan Pa was the Finnish ambassador to Kabul. He's kind enough to be here. Uh, there's a lot of fatigue in the West. It's been 10 years. Um, there's been a kind of NATO Article 5 regret a bit. Um, it was declared very early, and it's hard to get out of it. It's a bit like the Eurozone. You know, once you're in, there's no real legal way to get out. Um, a lot of people defended um, the intervention in Afghanistan for different reasons. The Americans were quite clear. This was an attack on the United States. Fine. Um, by and large, the French who have fought very well there, have defended it, as many other Europeans have done, as less about terrorism and alliance with America than about societal transformation. Human rights, gender equality, kids to school, um, constitutional change, um, not making the mistake we did before of letting Afghanistan drift. Um, how does it feel now from Kabul? Is it a safer place, a more secure place, a more sustainable place? What would you say are the big accomplishments um, and the biggest worries you have as 2014 approaches? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, also thank for the organizers of this uh, conference. Uh, I have been coming to uh, uh, Tallinn in my previous life uh, for about uh, <clears throat> more than 20 years as a defense official. And uh, I see lots of my, my friends, almost half of the audience is, is my friends uh, from those, those days. But uh, 
I do have a different uh, life now, and I have a new life uh, in, in Kabul, and, and um, I'm a little uh, sort of surprised that I'm in this uh, position that I, I, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, uh, Estonian defense issues, but, uh, but uh, uh, Afghanistan. And um, we had a, a brief uh, talk about this uh, just before, the, before we started, and uh, I promised to uh, give you the sort of a, a global vision uh, the, as, as the last speaker uh, of, of sort of a, a theory of, uh, of how, how, how the world uh, functions uh, you know, after, after these uh, two, three days. But um, I thought of it actually, and, and then I, I thought that uh, I would do something even, even more impossible, and that is to, uh, to give my view on how uh, Afghanistan will function uh, uh, after 2014. Because I think that uh, if we are honest, I don't think that anybody really knows. Uh, it can tip this way, it can tip that way. But my, my own personal view after 20 months now in, in, uh, in Kabul is that uh, there's, a, there's a window of op opportunity that is open. Uh, it is not going to be open too many years, but, uh, but I would say that uh, it, it is open 2014, 2015. And not being uh, foolishly naive, uh, optimistic, I'm still optimistic that uh, things uh, can pan out uh, in a positive way. Um, um, I must say that uh, my faith uh, certainly was not shattered, but, was, but it was uh, shaken a little bit uh, uh, between the, uh, the uh, uh, night uh, in between 15th and 16th of April when I was uh, uh, listening to and participating in, 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 uh, in an artillery barrage, uh, weapons barrage, uh, about 200 meters from my residence, uh, uh, from 1.30 in the morning to about 5.30 in the morning. So four hours um, of uh, uh, different kinds of weapons uh, uh, used. Uh, uh, my wife was here. Uh, slept through the whole thing, so, <coughs> so uh, uh, what it is that uh, she's just uh, cool and composed, uh, which she is, uh, or what, but, uh, but uh, I was uh, uh, awake and counting, uh, you know, uh, from my past history, I have, I have some understanding of how, how weapons sound, so I was <laughs> counting how many this and how many that weapons were, or, or shot. So there are set setbacks, I mean, that's, that's the point, is that there are, there are setbacks, and there are going to be setbacks. But the overall picture is, uh, I, I think it's more positive uh, than, uh, than people usually understand. And I, I think I would, uh, I, I, I won't go into, into details, but, uh, but just mention that the uh, economy is doing so much better than, than uh, 10 years ago. I mean, we have to take that perspective, I mean, uh, from starting from 2001, 2002, uh, uh, and, and the last 10 years. It's four times uh, the per you know per capita income is four times uh, higher, may almost five times higher than it was then. Uh, health services are, are available to the figure is eighty five percent of the of the people. Then about five percent of the people. Education uh, has improved. Uh, Eight point four uh, million children at, at, at school. Forty percent of them roughly are, are, are girls. Uh, there is a very lively and functioning uh, uh, open press, uh, open media. Uh, elections have been have been arranged uh, three times already. Major national elections uh, since 2001. Uh, granted, they were not the kinds of elections that uh, Estonians would have been proud of, but uh, no internet voting. No internet voting, <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe a little bit more difficulties than. Uh, than people are accustomed in, in this uh, nook of the woods here, but, uh, but still they were, they were carried out. <coughs> um, and there are op opportunities. I, I think uh, there are sort of uh, grand scale opportunities for, Af uh, for Afghanistan. One of them is uh, that uh, there is a brisk uh, regional cooperation going on now. Uh, the so-called Istanbul process, uh, Istanbul initiatives uh, brought uh, the uh, 
uh, so-called so heart of Asia countries, 14 of them to Istanbul in the beginning of, uh, of uh, November. Uh, we talk now a lot about uh, Chicago, which is very important. We not talk about Tokyo in, in, in July, which, which both, con both uh, uh, meetings are, uh, are very important. But uh, there's another uh, important meeting on the 14th of June in Kabul, and that is uh, this uh, heart of the uh, Asia countries come back and, and talk about uh, uh, regional uh, confidence and security building measures. I mean, they, it's, it's like, uh, it's uh, almost, it's a, there's a deja vu to uh, the 1970s, late 60s and 1970s in Europe. Of course, uh, uh, these uh, confidence building measures so far are basically about uh, economy and, and cultural uh, uh, exchanges, stuff like that. Uh, some uh, border issues, but uh, who says that they could not uh, graduate into into more uh, security and and uh, security producing kinds of of uh, uh, CSBMs? The other uh, the other positive sign, uh, uh, a huge opportunity for the Afghans is the uh, uh, the uh, uh, extractive uh, industries. Uh, uh, the uh, first the Russians and then the Americans, uh, you know, have come uh, with their expertise to uh, to study the the, uh, the lay of the land and and uh, the figure that we we use now is that uh, there are three trillion dollars, uh, uh, three thousand billion dollars worth of uh, of uh, copper, iron ore. Uh, rare earth metals uh, and so forth and so on, oil, uh, gas. So uh, if and when, I believe, I mean, since I'm not optimistic uh, <laughs> as a person, I, I would say that uh, when these uh, uh, riches are, are being uh, uh, dug out from the, from the, from the ground, uh, uh, Afghanistan is uh, going to get... Uh, Wealthier and 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 uh, and uh, living will be will be better there. Uh, there is of course a big if uh, uh, also in the sense that uh, there is uh, hardly any infrastructure that has to be built. But there are these regional uh, plans, uh, quite sophisticated plans uh, to build uh, railroads uh, to uh, uh, to uh, bring uh, uh, you know to, to, to bring. Uh, uh, gas pipelines uh, through Afghanistan, uh, from uh, Turkmenistan all the way to India. All, all this is uh, very positive, and, and um, uh, I don't have time to explain you know, in detail, but, uh, but just uh, the po my point is that, uh, that uh, Afghanistan does not re need to be dependent on, on others if they play their cards right, and if, uh, if the foreign investment uh, is made possible. Now it is... Every time when I try to uh, wake up my my Finnish colleagues and, uh, and Finnish industries, um, they ask me the first question. They ask me, "Is it uh, safe to be there?" And uh, I cannot say that it is safe, um, but I, I can say that it is not awfully awfully unsafe. But, uh, but they still don't dare to come and and, and uh, invest uh, in these uh, in, in these uh, possible areas of um, of great. Uh, uh, worth and and um, and uh, improvement for uh, for the life of the uh, of the Afghan citizens. Um, of course, there are there are risks. Uh, uh, one of the risks uh, certainly is that uh, that this uh, 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 insurgent activity uh, will continue. Uh, that uh, that put that puts a damper on on many things that even I have now very briefly briefly mentioned here. But um, um, here I'm quite skeptical, actually uh, quite cynical. I don't think that, uh, that one can stop, uh, in the foreseeable future, one can stop uh, the Taliban and other uh, uh, insurgent groups uh, from attacking here and there and you know, de needling here and there, assassinating here and there, like uh, we just heard this morning that, uh, that the, uh, Mr. Rahmani was... Um, was assassinated, uh, but uh, for for most of the country, I think uh, the uh, planned uh, number of troops and and uh, and and and, and uh, 
and the troops that are by by month are getting getting better and better uh, because of more training, uh, more sophisticated weaponry, and so forth. Uh, I think they can hold on their own uh, from 2015 on. If they can't, then there's something wrong about the training because you know if if you have 228,500 people in uh, in in the your security force uh, and uh, you're faced with uh, maybe 25 30,000 uh, uh, part-time and full-time talibs uh, or and other groups uh, you should be able to handle that uh, so that uh, in 95% of the country or at least 80% uh, of the country the uh, the life can go on normally and and uh, and, and then we have to just to accept the the, uh, the the risk, but that really that really emphasizes the point that uh, we, the international community, we have to be, we have to understand that we have to support uh, Afghan forces still, uh, a lot, you know, many many years from from now. We are, we're now talking about uh, not only transition which is going on, but the but the transformation decade, uh, which looks to uh, the years to. Uh, 2024 to 2025 and we we should be able to uh, uh, make commitments and we the international community make commitments to uh, to uh, support Afghanistan at least uh, throughout that decade um, I can advertise that uh, my own country Finland has has already made commitments of course no government in a democracy can make a commitment uh, 10 years hence but uh, we have made a commitment already to increase, uh, while we we bring home our combat troops, uh, we are going to uh, uh, spend much more money on on uh, development. Uh, the uh, last year, 21 million euros. This year, 24 million euros. Uh, 2014, more than 30 million euros. So, so at least uh, we are when well we are uh, decreasing our presence uh, in military terms, leaving uh, advisors, leaving men mentors. Then at the same time we bring up the uh, the uh, development end, uh, and um, so I think I think I mean um, uh, I'll stop here, but uh, but uh, just uh, uh, leave uh, sort of one warning uh, for all of us, uh, all of us uh, outsiders, and that is that uh, we should not leave uh, the uh, Afghans the way they were left alone uh, in like um, Mr. Saleh was already mentioning here in 1989, uh, 1996, 2001, 2002, we should have at least learned some, some lessons from that and, and uh, stay with the course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I must say I agree with you. There's nothing like incoming mortars to concentrate the mind. One thinks about things slightly differently. Um, Gatling, Gatling gun does it to you also. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, Mr. Seti, Pakistan took some incoming fire from, from the panel, and I wondered if you wanted to respond to some of the things that were said before we go to questions. Thank you. Yes, I do want to comment very briefly. Um, I have a flight to catch, so I'll be off in about six, seven minutes. Some quick points. Two of my colleagues mentioned strategic depth, Pakistan's quest for strategic depth in Afghanistan. I think we, that's old hat now. Um, it's a red herring. There was a time, absolutely, when Pakistan was deadlocked with India, and Pakistan was promoting jihad against India and sending terrorists and militants across the line in, to create trouble in Kashmir. That was certainly, at that time, strategic depth was an issue. But that's no longer the case. Three years ago, the Pakistani army explicitly defined their terms of engagement. They said, we need an Afghanistan that is stable, peaceful, and friendly towards Pakistan. I remember taking this up, issue up with the army chief at that time. Why necessarily friendly? Why not neutral? And I didn't get a good answer. But now I get good answers. And the answer is that they've dropped friendly from their equation. They're saying, all we want is a stable and peaceful Afghanistan. Strategic depth was India-related. Strategic depth is out now. Even the Pakistani army acknowledges that is a no-go strategic concept. They're trying to build peace with India now. We have opened up trade with India that was supposed to be the last thing we would do 
We wanted to settle Kashmir, we wanted to settle Siachen, we wanted to settle everything else. And then we said we'd start trading with the enemy when the enemy was no longer an enemy. But now, in the last six months, we have opened up trade with India. We are about to give India most favored nation state. And the political parties in Pakistan, to a man, are on the same page regarding peace with India. The opposition leader only two days ago said that we want to remove the visa regime with India, even if India doesn't want to do that. He says we want to open up uh, the borders of Pakistan to Indians. I mean, a radical change is taking place in Pakistan. This notion of strategic depth is a red herring. It doesn't work anymore. Pakistan is seriously concerned about the Taliban as much as Afghanistan is concerned about the Taliban. <clears throat> We are worried about what uh, a Taliban, uh, a disgruntled Taliban in that region will do for us, as I've just explained. The second thing is that this question of the grand, the big objective. What is the big objective? <coughs> My Afghan colleague said the big objective is to ensure that extremism is rooted out. Well, hello. I thought the big objective was to get rid of Al-Qaeda. Because the Americans were talking to the Taliban in 1996, 97 about oil and gas pipelines. And the Americans said cruise missiles raining into Afghanistan to get OBL in 1998, and that uh, nothing happened. And now the Americans have got OBL, and American interlocutors and statesmen tell me that 85% of the Al Qaeda network in Afghanistan has been degraded, knocked out, finished. And whatever little, the few the foreigners that there are can be taken care of in due course. Uh, the theater against Al-Qaeda has shifted from Afghanistan to Yemen and to Africa. Uh, this is easily admitted. So what have we done? Are we losing sight of the big objective? Or now are we into a, have we changed the goalpost? And finally, what I'd like to uh, talk about is, uh, uh, you know, in a conversation uh, with the prime minister shortly before I came here, he said something very interesting to me, and I talk about the Pakistani Prime Minister. I was asking him about his uh, talks with President Karzai. And he said, you know, I asked President Karzai, um, so are the Americans going to leave bases behind? How many bases? What sort of bases? Can you enlighten us? Because the Americans are not telling us too much. And President Karzai is given to dram being dramatic. And President Karzai told him, half in joke, and half seriously, he said, these bases are not for us. You are the nuclear power in the region. These bases are meant for you. Now, my great fear is that 87% of Pakistanis are anti-America, religious revivalism, not owning this war against uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, but having no sympathy for Al-Qaeda. Pakistan is in a very difficult situation. The army is changing its paradigm. But the civilians are not strong enough now to take ownership of this, which is why today one small incident across the Afghan-Pakistan border in Salala has led to a disruption of NATO supplies for six months. The army wanted to send a signal. They wanted a disruption for 10 days, 15 days. The politicians can't handle the, the, the blowback. Even now, the politicians are not ready to take the responsibility for restoring the NATO pipeline because another drone strike uh, will lead to another backlash. This is election year, not just for America, it's an election year for Pakistan as well. So it doesn't help when Pakistan is being painted as the rogue in the, in, you know, in, in, in the end game. Pakistan has to be a player and Pakistan has to be on your side. And you have to create the conditions to enable Pakistan's uh, fledgling democracy and the civil military equation to be restored back in Pakistan. And for the first time, I see a degree of optimism. The civilians are getting an edge over the military. The civilians are on the same page vis-a-vis -vis making peace with India. The in military is backing out of its strategic depth doctrines. But we need help. We don't like the Taliban as much as you don't like them. We don't like them. But we need to find a home for them somewhere so that they are disengaged from Al-Qaeda and that they don't turn in on Pakistan. Their home is Afghanistan. They have to find a place there. They cannot be allowed to find a place in Pakistan. And the last thing you want is for President Karzai's prophecy to be fulfilled, that you end up having to worry about Pakistan's nukes and radicalism in Pakistan and Talibanism in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you'll and, excuse me, and I'd if you like have to, to go, go. Thank you. I, 
I have to say, sometimes I worry more about Pakistan than Afghanistan. <laughs> you know? um, we, thank you, Mr. Sethi. We now have about... <laughs> I think we have time for one good round of questions. So um, I hope that you will identify yourself. If possible, address your question to somebody. Um, and then let's, let's go on from there. Mike Holtzel, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Mike Holtzel from Johns Hopkins Sice in Washington. Uh, Mr. Seti anticipated my question, actually, about uh, Kashmir and Siachen. I just would like to ask our Indian and our uh, Afghan colleague if they agree with his assessment that Pakistan has come around to a, to a totally different mindset vis-a-vis uh, vis India. Um, and then could we get the microphone to Rina Kionka and then e explain, Rina, please. Yes, okay. thank you, Steve. Um, uh, Rina Kionka from the European External Action Service. I'm wearing a jacket that I bought in, in Tashkent, um, and this is the background of my question to all the panelists. Um, what we haven't heard here is about the former Soviet countries in Central Asia and the... Um, the effect that the drawdown will have on these countries. There are three of them with borders on, on Afghanistan. Um, I've spent a fair bit of time visiting all five of the capitals uh, since 2007 when the EU uh, inaugurated a Central Asia strategy, part of which is um, to conduct human rights dialogues with all five of the countries. And I can tell you that the single greatest fear uh, in connection with the drawdown um, in these countries is the rise of radical Islam, um, which brings with it, um, for any number of reasons, um, uh, also some considerable human rights concerns. So I would like to hear from the panelists on um, the panelists' views on the effect of the drawdown on the Central Asian uh, former Soviet republics. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. And let's take a, a question from former NATO ambassador. Kurt, Kurt Volker. Volker. Thank you. Please. Uh, my question, I just want to ask a very simple, specific, practical question. We, we have a framework for what the international policy toward Afghanistan is going to be over the next couple of years with the drawdown 2014 and all that. Um, frankly, hearing the discussion, the analysis where we are, it's not a very credible framework that this is going to leave a good situation. And the question I have is, is it broad enough and is there enough yet to be filled in that we can actually turn this into more of a success, knowing this framework that we're going to be working in. Okay. I'll try to take one more. There's a woman right there, please. That's great. Thank you. Hello. Mal Helen from the Open Estonia Foundation. I have a question to Paul Jervenba. Uh, how about non-state actors in Afghanistan? What will happen with them? And uh, what is uh, e your assessment about their impact on the developments in Afghanistan? Thank you. That's a good question. Thank you very, very much. Why don't we just now go to the panel and just take um, what you want. Um, but I hope someone will try to answer the last question also. Um, so would you like to yes, begin? start with the first question okay. on the Pakistan mindset. Um, while I do not deny, you know, there has been a great deal of opening up between India and Pakistan. As, and India took the initiative back in 2003 to set up a set of CBMs with uh, Pakistan. And at that time it was, you know, but so far Pakistan was always suspicious of India's motives because it was felt that it's under US pressure. We all felt that, you know, we are being asked to accommodate, you know, so it was uh, because we were still in a very nascent stage of a, a new relationship with the US, the post Cold War. But when it comes to, you know, there is a genuineness of feeling, there is, a, a, you know, a feeling within the Indian establishment that you cannot resolve certain issues. You have to have peace in the neighborhood, of, uh, not only in Afghanistan, but also in Pakistan. And we, uh, I mean, India does not want Pakistan to disintegrate, as the Pakistanis might keep talking once. You know, we are very happy that all the trouble takes place and they act as a good buffer between the trouble and India. But when it comes to the mindset, the Pakistan army's single point agenda has been a very India-centric policy. The kind of advantages the Pakistan army enjoys within the country, within Pakistan. And they do not have any other difference with a regional power. 
And for a country the size of Pakistan, a 5.5 million uh, army is not a small force. Where is it deployed? Not against Afghanistan, I mean, to a very limited extent now. You have no other trouble spot on your borders. So that becomes a little difficult to uh, accept and to have any long-term uh, projections. Things may be changing, but it's the ISI element which completely controls a certain segment and this close linkage between the Park Army and the ISI. This is where, and they have uh, led a sustained cross-border war, you know, like uh, against India. And this is something which is of concern to us. Even on Chin, uh, uh, um, Kayani spoke of a settlement in Chin. But the settlement was that India goes back from, you know, the heights which India uh, possesses or occupies. But after Kargil, we are not willing to back off on those. So there is a trust deficit over there. Okay. Paul, do you want to respond? Polly, no. Do you want to yeah, uh, I think there are three questions, right. and I want to uh, answer very, very briefly uh, Rina's question on the uh, uh, former Soviet uh, uh, countries. Uh, I think, um, I mean, what they now are are, are getting is uh, the sort of a, a bad end of the deal. I mean, they are they're getting uh, drugs and uh, and the. Um, um, the uh, sort of radical uh, Islamic groups uh, are thriving on both sides of the borders, and uh, for, uh, for, uh, what I mean is from Afghanistan. So, so uh, it's uh, it is not a positive thing that they are now now getting. But I, I think there is a there's a great uh, chance for for those countries also to enjoy the the uh, uh, the economic opportunities that uh, that there are. Um, I about uh, two months ago, I I. Uh, went to uh, uh, Dushanbe uh, in uh, Tajikistan and, and uh, to a regional economic conference there called uh, RECA. And uh, at least the way I read it was that uh, there's, a, there, you know, there's, a, there's a great uh, enthusiasm of, of those countries to be sort of stakeholders in, in, in the economic promises that are there. Not, uh, not, uh, the promises are promises, but they are not uh, fulfilled yet, but at least uh, uh, someday they could be. Kurt uh, asked about the, uh, uh, the sort of, is, is this uh, framework that we are, we are using to analyze and look at uh, Afghanistan, is it broad enough? Um, not one uh, piece of the framework uh, alone, but, uh, but I think this, uh, and I, uh, just for, for brevity's sake, I'll just uh, na name uh, uh, Chicago, uh, uh, Kabul, and, and Tokyo as, as a kind of a pieces of that framework. So, uh, so again, if things go right, uh, and uh, you know that we can, we can get uh, uh, a good uh, total result uh, of those different parts of, of, of framework. That's that would be my my answer. And then there was a, a question on non non state actors in Afghanistan. I think uh, they would find it very hard to to uh, live on in Afghanistan if uh, if we failed. In our in our uh, common policy of, of trying to uh, the, uh, make uh, it possible for the for the uh, uh, f for the uh, Afghan government to function the way it does today, uh, without undue pressure from from Taliban and, and, uh, and other groups. I mean, they, the women's issues obviously are would be would be very fragile uh, if uh, Taliban came to cover government. Uh, the uh, human rights issues in general would be would be very much harder than today. But uh, once again, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that they don't uh, get into a situation where where they will be squeezed too hard. Uh, Mr. Salah, I think you should have the last word. So please. Okay. <clears throat> in regards to uh, Central Asia's relationship with Afghanistan, I think there is a massive chance. If Afghanistan stabilizes as a pluralistic society and democratic values, even substandard, is maintained, we will provide an alternative trade outlet 
for central relations through Pakistan to Karachi or through Chabahar through Afghanistan. So our hope is in long run we <clears throat> never again become a buffer zone, we become an integrator in the region connecting subcontinent with Central Asia. But also there is a challenge, and Af if Afghanistan is redominated by militant extremism and through a deal Taliban are brought back into the country, Central Asia will try to uh, stay away from us, and they will uh, rely on the northern route for doing trade and, and exporting, uh, exporting their energy, and uh, they will have less option uh, uh, if without Afghanistan. One opportunity was lost immediately after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They immediately looked upon Pakistan and South Asia for uh, uh, opening up, but then Pakistan exported mullahs and extremism and, and all of that, so they closed back. So the trade with Central Asia now is minimum. It's mainly about raw material and not much uh, uh, cultural, uh, cu cultural inter uh, uh, interaction. So the vision is, if we stabilize enough, it will be emergence of a new region away from domination of certain powers. And there will be trade in this region, there will be new outlets, and Pakistan will become a a energy hub, not a hub for terrorism and, and militancy. So there is, there is a role for Pakistan, and it's a very dignified role if they break this box in which they have been living for 40 years to dominate the region through promotion of militancy and, and extremism. The other point is, uh, <clears throat> my friend Mr. said he said very good things. If I retrieve my diary from 2003, 4, 5, all the way to the day President Musharraf resigned or was forced to go, it was the same thing. We are not Pakistan of before. We are being heard. We cannot fire into our own leg. This is Northern Alliance literature. We are being a scapegoat. We have changed. It's a new Pakistan. It is the same literature, but the behavior has not changed. I gave you an, a, an a evidence that the behavior has, was not changed. About 10 days ago, a US, Afghan, and Pakistan uh, delegation met in Islamabad. And they specifically agreed on something called safe passage to facilitate the Taliban talks. What is practically the meaning of the safe passage? Pakistan will find a Taliban leader from below the table and say, Look, he wants to talk. According to the Safe Passage Agreement, we have to give him security in Islamabad. They have these leaders in Quetta, in Lahore, in Peshawar, in Karachi. They provide episodic cooperation to the United States. They will never provide wholesale cooperation because in their interest, a militant extremism is considered a deterrence for Pakistan's defense next to their nuclear arsenal. Now, what he said about President Karzai saying to the Pakistani prime minister that these bases are against you, well, there is a very firm belief in Islamabad, very firm, that TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, are actually a group receiving assistance from India, Israel, and United States secretly to destabilize Pakistan down to zero governance and then denuclearize it. That is why they want NATO to fail in Afghanistan. They are of the view that a democratic Afghanistan poses a greater danger to Pakistan than a failed state. Well, I'm not sure if we've provided lots of hope. I hope we've shed a, a little more light. And thank you all for your patience, and thank the panel as well.